Okay, today we consider some applications of the Hahn Banach theorem, um, especially the geometrical version. So now let's look at uh, an example about the convex programming. So we first define, uh, first give a linear space. Okay, and we say that C is a convex subset of, of the X. Okay, remember that a set is called convex if uh, for any X, Y should say lambda X plus one minus lambda Y is in C for any x, y in C, and any lambda between 0 and 1. Right. In this case, we call the set of C convex. Uh, and I also can define a function, which is called a convex function. That is a mapping from a convex set to the set of real numbers. Convex function. Or convex functional if uh, if this x is a Banach space, and we call it a convex functional if for all x and y in C and all the lambda between zero and one, there is f of uh, lambda x plus one minus lambda y less than or equal to lambda times f of x plus 1 minus lambda f of y. Okay, and we know that this, geometrically this means if one decays, so say the x is just a set of, it's just a real line, and then this is the f of x. So this is the x, this is f of x. So if you have a point x, you have point y, then the uh, this just uh, means the line segment between uh, the x and the y. So it's any point in here. And the the left hand side right here means that the function value at that middle point. For example, here this is where the lambda x plus one minus lambda y is. And, uh, it says that the left hand side is the value here. The right hand side is the linear. It's a complex combination of the two values here. And the value at this point, this will be, so if I have the function values on this side, then this is like the right hand side. And this is like the left hand side. Okay, so you can see that if a function looks like a convex shape, then the right hand side is, uh, the left hand side is always, always less than or equal to the right hand side. Okay, it's always, this is always higher, this is always lower. Okay, that's the meaning of convex function. And uh, this is extended to uh, linear space. So it doesn't have to be just a uh, uh, Euclidean space. Okay, so with that, we can um, also define, uh, so you can see that this is the why we need to define f over a convex set because we actually need to evaluate the function. We should be able to evaluate the function at any of the middle points. So uh, it has to be a convex set before we define this, uh, to define this convex functional. Okay, we can also define this so-called epigraph of the function. So the epigraph, the epigraph of the function f is defined as uh, so notational-wise is this, but what's the meaning of this? It's actually a product space of C and the, the real, the set of real numbers. So it is defined as a collection of points, like this X and T, which belongs to C and R, and F of X is less than or equal to T. Okay, as you can see, this is a subset of the product of C and, F, C and R. Uh, 
uh, so for example, if C is Rn, then this epigraph should be living inside Rn plus 1. Okay? But in general, it could be it's just a, a subset of the product of C and R. So for this picture, so what this means is that the, uh, for any t that is greater than or equal to the function of f of x, then it's in the point, it's in the epigraph. So uh, for the picture here, this is the word f of x, uh, t equals to f of x, okay? Uh, and anything thing bigger than, any t bigger than that is also okay. So that means everything over here. Okay. So this is the, so this is the epigraph. This is the, this is the subset of a two-dimensional uh, space sensor or x, so sensor c is just in R1. So this is the subset of the R2. And that is the meaning of, uh, Geometric meaning of the epigraph. Okay, so with this, we can um, easily show that a function f is convex if and only if the epigraph of f is convex. Okay, so Okay, so the left hand side convex means this is convex functional. Okay, f is convex functional. The right hand side, this convex means that this is a convex set, convex subset of that. Okay, so y is functional. And this is a convex functional and this is a convex set. So that's pretty easy to show, and I leave this for you as an exercise. Uh, finally, we are going to consider so what, are you, what we are interested in here is the uh, convex program. Uh, or convex programming. So it is a typical optimization problem uh, trying to find the minimizer of some functional under some constraints. Okay? And we call it a convex program because all the involving uh, all the functionals involved here are convex functionals. Okay? Now we consider the convex functional. Oh, sorry, our convex program, sometimes called CP. So this problem is written in the following way. So we write this as a CP. Uh, and just try to minimize the functional f of x, where x is a uh, some point in the convex set, such that the g1 of x is less than equal to 0, g2 is less than equal to all the way to gn, less than equal to 0. Okay, so this f, g1, gm, they are all convex functionals. Okay, they are all convex functionals. This f is called objective function. Objective function or functional. And the, this g1 through gm, they are called a constrained functional. Okay, these are called the constrained Okay, so we're looking for the minimizer of f under the constraint that x is a point in C, and at the same time, the g of x is less than or equal to 0 for every of these g's. Okay, so that is a convex program. Okay, so the question is, the general question is, how do we find this such a point? Well, in general, finding such a point not, it's not that trivial, it's not that easy. Uh, the how do we find, how we find it depends on, as you can imagine, we, uh, a common way to do this, or a uh, reasonable approach to do this is to, first uh, characterize what the solution is. So if, say, if x satisfies this, it's a minimize, it's a solution to this, then what x should satisfy? So it's pretty much like, uh, say, we're minimizing a function f of x. Let's just think this as a univariate function. The f is from r to r. Remember how we find the minimizer of this? We really just uh, take the derivative, 
set to zero, we know that if the f is differentiable, then um, uh, and the, and f takes the minimum at some point x, then the derivative there must be zero. Although not all the points with derivative zero are minimizers, right? Some of them could be maximizers. Some some of them could be uh, saddle point or station stationary point. But uh, derivative being zero is a necessary condition for a point to be to be a, a minimizer. Okay, and the same thing here. Uh, we want to first add. Uh, figure out what is the necessary condition for a solution for point x to be a solution and then we can try to figure out an algorithm or method to find the point satisfying this necessary condition and then among the points satisfying this necessary condition we can further um, identify which one is the the true solution which one is the global minimizer right like this case if we find the fact of derivative equals zero then this gives us a bunch of candidates whose derivatives are zero, and then from them, we can try to identify the global minimizer. Okay, that's our goal. Okay, so what we're going to do here is that um, we can actually get a uh, necessary condition for the solution of this convex program uh, in a very simple way. So what we mean by simple is that if what we're going to claim right here is that if x, say x naught, is a solution, is a solution of Cp. Okay, that means it solves, it's minimized our f and this under those and satisfies those constraints. Then there exists lambda one lambda 2, lambda m, and I use hat here. They which are all non-negative, such that the uh, the x naught actually minimize this. So I'm writing this down so you can see. Okay, so that means uh, if x naught is a solution of the convex program, then there exists a lambda one through lambda m, which are all non-connective, such that when you when you form a new objective function, the new objective function looks like this, like this. So it just it's not separating. Uh, it actually combines the objective function and also the constraint function into a single function, uh, and this is just a linear combination of those. Uh, of the GIs and this F, such that the X is actually minimizing this, okay, minimizing this thing because it is taking uh, it's less than equal to the right hand side. And apparently, this should be equal because X not itself is some point in C, okay, but it's minimizing this. So it's like that we're converting a constrained optimization problem or constrained convex pro problem into an unconstrained convex problem. Because this is a single objective function, but uh, uh, you should notice you should notice that this is something that we so far we can we're trying to prove that they exist, and we don't know what are the actual values of them. So we cannot really get those values and try to solve this. So in practice, that's not doable. But if we know this structure, we can still derive lots of new uh, properties of this solution x naught. But right now, what our goal is to show that this is actually hold. Okay, we want to show this is this uh, this actually holds for some uh, for some points. So that's what we want to prove right now. Okay, so let's see how do we prove this. Remember that our goal is to show that if x naught is a solution, then there must be there must exist some uh, non-negative values like this such that this hold this holds. Okay. All right. Um, to show this, 
we um, kind of step back a little bit, we don't really know what uh, if these lambda i's are, exist or, or uh, they are like really greater than or equal to zero. We don't know this at all. We want to prove this. So uh, to start with, we we consider um, how should I say? We we try to prove the existence of not just lambda one through lambda m, but also lambda zero. Okay, so what we're going to do is we try to prove. We step back. A little, and we try to prove, or we want to show that there exists lambda zero, lambda one, all the way to lambda m, which are greater than or equal to zero, such that the lambda, I also put a lambda in front of f. F it's not plus some lambda i hat g i it's not less than equal to the minimum or I should simply say that this is less than equal to lambda not f of x plus sum lambda i so everything is the same as before except that I'm putting a lambda zero in front of f. For all the x in C, and let's try to first show this, show the existence of these things, such that this is hold, this hold, and then uh, we will show that lambda naught is actually positive, strictly positive, and in that case, we can just divide both sides by lambda naught, and then we'll get back to what we try to prove here. Okay, so that's the plan. So how do we do this? How do we show the existence of this? Um, so to show this, let's first uh, consider two sets. Two sets in R n plus one. Okay. Remember the m is the number of constraints. This c itself, the c, the set c here might be in the Banach space, so it's uh, maybe infinite dimensional. But the function value, uh, or this thing we're considering here, is it's only about the function values in the space of function values. So it's a real, it's a real space, it's Euclidean space. Okay, so I'm going to define the e to be such set. It, can, it is a, a subset of the uh, m plus 1 dimensional Euclidean space such that t naught is less than or equal to f of x naught and t i is less than or equal to 0 for all the i's between 1 and m. Okay, I will explain that later on. In a similarly, we are going to find another set or define another set f, which is something like this, such that um, there exists some x in C, such that the f of x is less than or equal to t naught, and the g i of x is less than or equal to the ti for all the i's. So again, i is from 1 to m. Okay, now let me explain what the, these two sets are. Remember first that they are all in Rm plus 1. Okay, they're all in Rm plus 1. And the first set E is just a collection of search points like t0, t1, tm. So this is the an m plus 1 dimensional vector. Okay, and I'm just collecting all the points like this t such that they are less than or equal to f of x naught, 0, or 0. Okay, oh, let me actually write it down. The e is actually 
the set of points. Such that t naught, t one, t m is less than or equal to f of x naught zero zero. Okay, and as you can see, this is the convex set because in the two D case, this is rather just uh, say this is a t naught dimension, t one dimension. Say this point, the value here is f of x naught. Then uh, the the set here is nothing but just this part, right? The x is less than or equal to is on the left of f of x naught. The y the t, sorry the t zero is less than or equal to f of x naught. The t one is less than or equal to zero. So it's just this area, and apparently that's a convex set. Okay, and now look, let's look at the f. So the f is also a collection of points like this. At the same time, it says that there exists some x in C such that the uh, we look at the function uh, objective function value and the constraint function values at this x. It will be f of x, g1 of x, all the way to gm of x. And that is less than or equal to t0, t1, t, uh, tm. Okay, so it's a collection of points like this. Now I'm going to show that this f is also convex. Why is that? Well, uh, to show this f is a convex set, we just need to show that any convex combination of two points in f is still in f. Okay, so to show this f is convex, let's say let this t naught tm and this t naught prime all the way to t m prime be in f. Okay, let them be in f. And if they're in f, means that there exists some x and x prime in C such that the f of x, g1 of x, gm of x, should be less than or equal to the t naught. Okay, this is the point. The x is for the point t, t zero, t t m, t one, all the way to t m. Okay, and also the for the point x prime, we have f of x. So f of x prime, g one of x prime, all the way to g m of x prime. It should be less than or equal to t naught prime, t one prime, all the way to t m prime. Okay, so if these two points are in F, then we know there exists two points x and x prime such that this hold, and then we try to show that the convex combination of these two is still in F. Okay, so the convex combination of the two is that t one to t m plus one minus lambda, lambda t zero prime to t m prime. Okay. And because of these two properties, two inequalities, we know that this should be greater than or equal to the convex combination of these two. Right? And now I can see that, let me move this a little bit to the right. The left hand side here is just uh, bigger than or equal to the lambda, the convex combination of the each of each component, corresponding component. Right? So it's just uh, the first component it will be greater, it will be just equal to this. It will be equal to this. But we know that since f is a convex functional, this is greater than this is greater than f of lambda x plus one minus lambda x prime. Okay, and similarly for the others, because all the g's are also are convex as well, the so gm lambda x plus one minus lambda x prime. Okay, so that means 
the right hand side, which is lambda, is a complex combination of the pull points. I always skip writing it. It's a complex combination of the two points, and it shows that this shows that this is also greater than or equal to this, and this is like evaluating the function f and g at the point lambda x plus one minus lambda x prime, and that is in C. So we do find this point here such that this is greater than or equal to the function value at this point. And according to the definition of f, this point, this point right here should be in f. Should be in f. Okay? And this implies that the f is a convex set. So both E and F are convex sets. And now we want to show that the interior of F does not overlap with E. Okay, we want to show that the uh, interior, sorry, interior of E is does not overlap with F. We want to claim this. Okay, so let's see what is the interior of E. So E is a rather simple set, like we said. This is like what the E is. And the interior will be just, uh, again, this part without the boundary. Okay, it will be this without the boundary. And this is actually just the set T naught T M where uh, F of, sorry, T is less than F of X naught. And T, sorry, T naught is less than one f of x dot, t1 is less than 0, tm is less than 0. Okay, so these are the interior. This is the interior uh, of E. Uh, I'm going to claim that these two sets do not overlap, because if not, this is proof of the claim. Uh, of the claim. If not, then there, may, there must be some point x, sorry, there must be some point uh, T, there exists a T naught all the way to Tm in Rm plus 1, such that on the one hand, it is in the interior of T E, that means the T0 through Tm is less than f of x naught, 0 all the way to 0. But on the other, other hand, it is in F, that means there exists some point X such that uh, this hold. Okay, so that's what we have on the left hand side. So there exists some X and uh, this factor is bigger than G1 of X, GM of X. Okay, so from here, what we see is this is strictly less than this. Okay, so that means there exists some g, some x, such that g1 of x is less than 0, g2 of x is less than 0, and all of, all of them are less than 0 for all the i's. At the same time, the f of x is less than f of x naught. But this is not possible. Right, because x naught was supposed to be the minimizer, supposed to be the solution. So there's no way to find another feasible point such that its function value, objective function value, is even smaller than f of x naught. Right, this is a feasible point because we know this is already less than zero, which satisfies the constraint. But on the other hand, it's also less than that, so that's not possible. And that is why we uh, prove the claim. So the so now what we have done is that. The, F and the E and F are both convex sets, and the interior of E and F do not overlap. So by the Hahn-Banach theorem, or the geometrical version of the Hahn-Banach theorem, there exists a separating plane that can separate these two. Or in other words, there exists some vector, which we call the lambda. So there exists a non-zero vector, lambda naught, lambda one, all the way to lambda m, this is, the, this is also in R, M plus 1, right? Such that these two sets are separated, meaning that for any point in the first set E, so if you take any inner product, or I should say, um, yeah, you take the inner product of, of this 
lambda vector with any point in E, let's say uh, say x lambda is less than or equal to y times lambda for any x in E and any x any y in f. Right? It's so like you have these two sets which are both convex. This is the E, this is the F, and then you have a separating plane. And this lambda hat tells us the direction of the separating plane. Okay, so getting back to the question we have, what is this X and the Y are? So I'm I don't need all the points, I just need uh, say for in the sys in the first set of E, I realize that the point F of X naught. Uh, and G one x naught all the way to G M x naught. This is the point in E. The reason is the E contains all the points right here, such that it's less than or equal to this value. But I know that this I can just take this x t naught to be f of x naught, and I know that G i of x naught are less than or equal to zero. So that's why this point. Here must be in E. Okay. On the other hand, I know that uh, the right hand side, the right hand side uh, for any point x, for any point x, uh, for any point x, I, I'm just taking this t naught t one t m to be. Uh, this corresponding value, then I will see that this is also inside. But the more than that, I realize that on the one hand, I know this is true, on the other hand is that for any, uh, I would say, C0, C1, all the way to Cm, that is a non-negative vector, there is f of x Plus, because on the one hand I know this, for any point x, this f of x, g1 of x, all the way to gm of x, they are in f. Okay, but the f contains anything that is bigger than this value as well. So that's why actually you can show that the f of x plus c naught, this is plus c one, all the way to gm plus c m, they should be also in f. Okay, so this is going to be the point x here. So I'm not, I shouldn't write x and y, it should be maybe u and v, because they are actually m plus 1 dimensional vectors, not points in c. Because there's u, this is the v. Okay, so this is what the u look like, and this is what the v look like. And then you make a inner product of the lambda and this u and then also lambda with the v. What do we get? So the lambda is like this. Okay, inner product of this vector and this vector is just uh, multiplying those things uh, right uh, correspondingly and then take the sum. So as we said by the Han Banach theorem, the uh, uh, f of x naught times lambda naught plus I'm writing the others like in this way, g i of x naught i is from 1 to m, this should be less than or equal to lambda naught times f of x plus c naught plus sum of i from 1 to m lambda i hat g i of x plus c i. Okay, and this should be true for any i Sorry, for any uh, x in C on the right hand side. Okay, so we got this. And what we can claim from here is that this all these lambda i's need to be greater than or equal to zero. The reason is, say, uh, I want to claim that all these things must be greater than or equal to zero. zero. The reason is, Look at the left hand side, this is just some fixed number, since x naught is fixed, right, it's a fixed number. But on the right hand side, the c can be anything greater than, uh, can be anything greater than equal to zero. So if, say, this is negative, 
If this is negative, then I just can just make this going to infinity. So this is less than zero, and this I can make it going to positive infinity. Then this is giving me a negative infinity term, which will be less than this, and that is contradiction to this to this inequality. And similarly, this must be greater than zero because if it is less than zero, less than zero, then making this going to positive infinity, I can again again make a right hand side going to negative infinity, and that is again contradiction to this inequality right here. So. Since this greater than zero is arbitrary, we know the lambda zero, lambda one hat, all the way to lambda m hat, they must be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so remember that we actually want to show that x naught is not just uh, this, but also x naught must be equal to must be greater than zero. So I can we can divide them. I mean, but before doing that, let's look at this uh, inequality one more time. Um, say if we uh, say if we take the right hand, take the x on the right hand side to be x naught, then uh, and be and they also take the c to be uh, zeros. Okay, take x to be x naught. And the C is to be zero. Then what do we have on the um, let's say this um, uh, let me say in this way. Um, should I say in this way? Um, I know that this is true, but it is actually because of the Hamburg theorem. It says that if I pick any other point, any point in E, uh, I put it here. Uh, this will work. Okay. So instead of putting this point, I put this f of x naught. But putting zeros below here, I know that they are also in, it's also in F, right? That's what it said. If you just put this point, this point itself is in E. Okay, so if we put if I put that point instead, and also I put this um, uh, again, I put this x not x equals x. So I'm writing that in this way. I take x not. Um, I should say in this way, maybe. Since this f of x naught, 0, 0, this is in the set E, and the f of x naught, f g g1 of x naught, all the way to gm of x naught, I know that this point is in f. Right? Yeah, just to choose that specific point x to be x naught. See, so I put this x as a naught, and I see that f of x naught through gm of x naught is also inside inside f. So I can put this two points. This is like my u. This is like my v. And then I put it here. Put it right here. I will get lambda naught f of x naught is less than or equal to lambda naught of f of x naught plus sum of lambda i at G i x naught as from one to n. Okay, so I will get that, and as you can see, this will be cancelled, and I will get the zero less than or equal to sum from one to n lambda i hat g i x naught. Okay, so I know that this lambda i must be greater than or equal to zero. But on the other hand, I know that x naught is a feasible point, so it has to be less than or equal to zero. So that means the sum is taking we're taking the sum of uh, m 
non-positive numbers because the product of these two must be less than or equal to zero. But if you take in the sum of non-negative value, non-positive values, you still get some positive value or non-negative value, still greater than or equal to zero. Then that just means that every term needs to be zero. Okay, so this means that the lambda i hat g i x zero hat as g i x zero must be equal to zero for all the i's from one to n. So that is a very important feature of this x naught. Okay, or in other words, if g i of x naught is less than zero, then lambda i hat must be equal to zero. Okay, so that is uh, a property about this lambda i's. But again, getting back to our one of the remaining question, we need to show that the lambda zero hat must uh, uh, is strictly positive. Okay. So we claim the lambda zero hat is strictly positive. We know that it's non-negative. So to show that this is true, we can say that if the lambda not lambda c is equal to zero, then what happens is um, using the same formula here, using the same one here. We see that lambda naught is zero, and this will be zero. So we will actually have the zero uh, less than or equal to this, right? And we say that, um, so I should say it in this way. Um, Okay, let me see in this way. I should uh, make this more clear. What I'm going to claim is that if there exists some x hat in C such that uh, the gi of x hat is less than zero for all the i's from one to n. So that means uh, we do can find some interior point of the constraints, constraint set formed by this. So our x, the c is a complex set, but we're looking for all the feasible points. That means all the points satisfying this. If there exists some x hat that not is not just in c, but also makes this strictly hold, it doesn't have to be a minimizer. It's just any point that satisfies this, then we can claim that the lambda naught must be positive, then lambda x naught must be positive. Okay, why is that? The reason is, um, as the picture I showed earlier, as the form I showed here, if, if lambda naught hat is equal to zero, then realizing that the f of x naught 0, 0, this point is in E, and for this x hat, I have f of x hat, g1 of x hat, gm of x hat. This point is in F, and according to the uh, definition of the lambda, we know that the lambda 0 hat f of x naught will be less than or equal to lambda naught hat f of x hat plus sum i from 1 to m, lambda i hat, g i of x hat. We know this is true, but because x naught is 0, so this is just 0. This is just equal to 0. So this is essentially 0. And 0 is left than equal to the right-hand side. But remember that um, if all this, the, the, the x hat makes the, all this less than zero, so this will be less than zero. And as I said, the right hand side must be equal to zero. Each term, um, uh, because that this is greater than equal to zero. And uh, now we have this whole thing equal to uh, greater than equal to zero. But remember that this each term of this 
is less than or equal to zero. So to make this hold, we have to make sure that every one of this is zero. Because otherwise, if one of this is positive, then the product of two is strictly less than zero. But all the other terms can must be uh, all the other terms must be less than equal to zero, right? So you have say you have lambda one hat g one of x hat plus all the way to lambda m hat g g m x hat. You know that this is greater than or equal to zero, and you know that everyone is less than or equal to everyone is less than or equal to zero. Okay, and now if there's some point in between some one of them, this is the greater than zero. This is sorry, this is three less than zero, and this is the greater than zero. Then this term will be strictly less than zero, and all the other terms are three less than zero. Then I'll have this less than zero, which is a contradiction to that. So that is not possible. So that means all these lambda i's must be equal to zero. All these lambda i's must be equal to zero. Now lambda zero is equal to zero, and all these lambda i's are equal to zero. And that means the whole vector is zero. And that is a contradiction to the Hahn-Banach theorem, which says that we must be able to find some non-zero vectors uh, to separate this. So there must be some non-zero functional that satisfies, or in this case, a non-zero vector uh, telling us a direction. So that's uh, where the contradiction is. Okay. So this is the contradiction to the Hahn-Banach theorem saying that this vector is non-zero. -non okay. And this implies that the lambda, the lambda uh, not here cannot be zero. Okay. And it's non-negative and it's not zero, so it has to be positive. And since it's positive, we can divide it on both sides, like as we said at the beginning. Okay, we can just divide this on both sides, then we just uh, call the lambda i over lambda zero to be our new lambda i. And that finishes the proof. Okay, so what this theorem, uh, this is actually the theorem, a uh, very basic important theorem uh, in convex programming, and I'm going to summarize, which is to prove it. I'm going to summarize the result. So this is the character Kuhn Tucker theorem, which says that say we have x, a linear space, c is convex in x. Okay, um, let's suppose. And this f, g1, all the way to gm, they are convex functionals. So uh, all convex functionals, and there exists some x hat in C such that the g1 of x hat all the way to gm of x hat, they are all less than zero. Then, if x naught is a solution of this convex program, as we showed before, then there exists lambda 1 all the way to lambda m, which are greater than or equal to 0, such that the f of x naught plus um, this and I had G I X not C equal to the minimum of F of X plus the sum lambda I G I X is from one to M. And actually, we know that this part is just zero, since uh, uh, as we showed before, for any uh, for any feasible point, this should be zero. Oh, sorry, for any x naught, this should be zero, right? So the one that we showed. Oh, 
Okay, so that's the um, proof that the Kuhn Tucker. I want to uh, say that this is a, there is a more famous, uh, more well known one uh, called the Karish. It's Karush or Karash. Kuhn Tucker. Or called the KKT. Uh, and that is uh, more specific to the case where X is the Euclidean space. Okay, and uh, uh, from there we can get a set of, um, should I say, the uh, necessary conditions for a point to be a minimizer of this, of X, X in, say, in R, in R, uh, N, such that the gi of x is less than equal to zero. And you can also include some uh, equality constraints, say that hi's, hj is equal to zero. Okay. Um, and then there is a so-called KKT condition to describe the, uh, the so this fg's, they don't even have to be convex. The f and g, and also H, J, they could be non-convex functions as well, but we want we, we need them to be differentiable. And the, the, K, the KKT conditions tell us the necessary condition for a point X to be the solution to this. Okay, and that is highly related to this one, but not uh, in the same form, and it is considered, uh, it is considered the case in Rn, okay, in the, in, the finite, in the Euclidean space. But it's more practical, the, in practice, when we do optimization where you, uh, working on Euclidean space only. Okay, so that's the uh, Kuhn Tucker theorem, and the proof is what we just done. We have just done before that. Okay, so now let's look at some example. One example of this is uh, extending the uh, concept of dark if or gradient into uh, to the Banach space. Okay, it's called uh, subdifferential and subgradient. Uh, in particular, we're interested in the case where the function is not really differentiable, because uh, you see, for a function like this, uh, we know the derivative of f at a point x is equal to the limit, say for example, f of x plus h plus f of x divided by h, which is going to zero, and you can also define this for where x is not in in the uh, uh, Rn. Oh, sorry, no, the x is not, yeah, x is actually in a uh, Banach space. And x plus h is also in the Banach space. You can do this as well. And in that case, let's uh, say you only have the x plus h, and uh, say f of x, and the denominator is the, I think it's the norm of h, and the limit is on the norm of h goes to zero. Okay, but this norm of h going to zero, the h could be approaching to zero in any way. In arbitrary ways, okay. So we can define the derivative uh, if the limit exists. But there's also cases that the function does not have a derivative in the classical sense. Uh, even in our own case, let's say we have a function. For example, you remember that. Uh, let's say this is the x, it's the one y, and this is the absolute value of x we define it to be from a function f. And you know that this kind of function does not, is not differentiable. It's differentiable everywhere except at this origin, right? But uh, it's not differentiable in this sense. In this sense, since the left limit, the right, the left derivative and right derivative are not equal. Uh, left derivative is negative one, uh, right derivative is positive one. But we can still define the so-called sub-differential or subgradient. Let's see what the definition of that is. So in general, the uh, subdifferential and subgradient can be defined for functionals. So let say f be a convex functional so this x is a Banach space. It's a convex functional uh, then for any x naught in the in x, we want to define this sub 
gradient of f at x0. The sub gradient of f at x0 is defined, is denoted in this way. It's like a partial uh, derivative notation <coughs> right here. And it is, uh, it is defined as a set. It's a set of linear functionals. Okay, so set of linear functionals we call the x star in this, in the due space, or the uh, all the linear functionals. Where x star x minus x naught plus f of x naught is less than or equal to f of x for all the x in x. Okay, so that's the um, definition for this. This is called subgradient. A sub differential. Okay, and uh, a, any particular one of this, if there's an element in this, uh, so x star in this, it's called a particular x star in this uh, set is called a sub gradient. Okay, now let me explain what that is. So this contains all the linear functionals, such that when you apply this, so this is like applying the linear functional here to this point. So for any point x in the space x, you apply this linear functional to that. Remember that these two things are totally irrelevant. This is just some point in the here. So this x is different from this x, just two different things. So this is a linear functional applied to this, plus, you know that we'll get a real number, right? And uh, plus the function value at this point x0 is less than or equal to the function value at this. Then we call it a sub-differential. Okay, so, and any specific element in this set is called a sub-gradient. So you can, for this example, I'm going to show that uh, the linear, this one is nothing but the slope. Okay, it's going to be the slope, and this left hand side is giving us uh, the straight line that is passing through the point x naught f of x naught uh, with the slope x star. And I want to show that this line, this straight line, is under this curve, under the function f x. So in this case, this is the f of x for different value of x. This is f of x. And this left hand side is a uh, is a straight line, and then I want it to be below this curve, so you can see that this is below the curve, right? Because of this curve, this is also below the curve. So anything like this is below the curve. So you can the extreme case is this is below the curve, and this is below the curve. So this is nothing nothing but just the slope of these curves. So as you can see, it is ranging from negative one to one. So for this particular example, if this is the f of here, so the the subgradient, oh sorry, the subdimension of f at the point zero is just negative one to one. Okay, and the uh, any element or any point in between is called a subdifferential. Oh sorry, it's called a subgradient. So this is a subdifferential. Any point in between is called sub gradient for this call, for this function at point zero. Okay, um, and it will be easy to show that if the function is actually differentiable at that point, then the sub differential uh, only has one element, and that element is the actual differential or gradient of the function. Okay, and this is a, a very important concept for convex functionals or convex functions. Uh, if you um, strike yourself to the Euclidean space, and it has uh, it is it is considered as a generalization of the standard gradient. In case the function is not differentiable, we can still define the sub differential. Okay, so the question right now is: Can we use the result above to show that the sub 
temperature exists, or sub temperature is non empty set. Uh, and the claim is this. Suppose we have a convex functional. Okay. And uh, uh, the f is continuous at the point x0. Then the subdifferential of f at x0 must be non empty. Okay, there must be some subgradient at the point x0. Okay, if the function f is if the function f is a fun convex functional and is continuous at x0. Okay, so let's see how do we prove this. Okay, to prove this, let's consider the epigraph. Okay. The epigraph of f and the point x0 f of x0. Okay, on the one hand, I want to show that this, because f is convex, so the epigraph is a convex set. This is the convex set in c times r. Okay, and also this convex set um, has an interior point. The reason is because this function f is continuous at x0. Let me show you in this picture so you can see that. This is x0, say, uh, and you have a convex function. And it's continuous at the point x now, so it's at least the neighbor, the neighborhood is uh, a continuous function. So what I'm claiming is that you look at this point. Uh, this will be my f of x naught. Okay. And now let's just say just look at uh, f of x naught plus one. Just add it, f of x naught plus one. And that'll be something here. Okay. So because uh, the function is continuous there, then I know that within the neighborhood, within the neighborhood of this, all the points are taking value pretty close to, uh, I should say, uh, uh, near this f of x0. Okay, so all the function values are pretty close to f of x0. So that means if I look at the a, so if I look at a point or neighborhood near the this point, which is x naught f of x naught plus one, I can see that it's completely inside the epigraph, right? So this epigraph, as you can see, that uh, this epigraph must have an interior point. So it is interior is not empty. Okay, so now I have a convex set with the non-empty interior, and also I have a point. Which is, uh, which is not in the interior, right? This because this is the point that is not in the interior, since any number less than this is not inside the set anymore. So this is not interior in the interior, and then by the Hambana theorem, we can show that we can see that there exists. Okay, so now since the interior of the epigraph of f is non empty and this x not f of x not does not belong to the interior of the epigraph and also the epigraph of f itself is convex we know that by the Hambana theorem this implies that uh, there exists some linear functional defined on uh, let's say this linear functional is uh, x star or x naught star um, we just use x star star and the c which is in the is a linear functional of x R. So what this means is, so this is C. This is not a geometric version. It's actually the original version uh, of the Hambana theorem. You apply this x star C to the point 
in uh, uh, to this point x naught f x naught to this point should be less than or equal to what do you have here applying it to any point in the interior of f or inside f inside the graph of f so apply it to this where this x and t is in epigraph, any point in the epigraph. Okay, so this application is actually applying this XR to that and this C to this. But this is just a number, so it applying to that is just multiplying them, right? So you have the X star, X naught. I'm writing this as inner product shape, but it's actually just applying some functional to some point. Okay, plus C of f x naught. On the right hand side, same thing x star x plus C t. So we will know that uh, this for any uh, for any for any x t in this. So I can rewrite this as s f of x and f of x plus some s, because this is what the epigraph is, right? This s is just some number bigger than equal to zero. So let me write it in that way. So this is just a C x star and x plus C times f of x plus s for any x in the points, sorry, in x and any t greater than or equal to 0. So any s greater than or equal to 0. OK, so now I'm going to again claim that the C is greater than or equal to zero because the left hand side is a fixed number and the right hand side uh, can change uh, with different s. If a C is negative, then I can make this s tending to infinity. I can make it tend to infinity, positive infinity, so that this is less than zero, this is going to positive infinity, so this product will be going to negative infinity, and that is contradiction to this inequality right here. So the C must be greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Uh, we actually can claim that the C is strictly greater than zero, because if not, then we will have x star. So if C is equal to zero, then as you can see, the left hand side will only have x star and x dot left and on the right hand side we only have x star and x and this is true for any x in the space x and then we can uh, rearrange it because this f star is just some linear functional and it can be applied to x minus x naught and this is always greater than or equal to zero for any x in here and this just means that x star is a uh, is a zero functional because uh, if it's non-zero, it cannot make everything greater than zero, right? Because if if there exists some x such that this is greater than zero, then when you apply this to x not minus x, you have this less than zero, which is contradiction to that, uh, since it says that it's greater than zero for any x. Okay, so if c is zero, then from here we'll get that the uh, x star is zero. And that means the x star can see as a couple uh, in the in here. It is a linear, it's a zero functional. And that is contradiction to the Hamana theorem because this is that this, this thing is always non-zero. Okay, that's where the contradiction is. So that means the C must be greater than zero. Now if C is greater than zero, then we go back to this, it's less than that. Then, uh, by taking s to be 0, and the c, we divide both sides by c, then we can see that uh, we take, say, we take x naught star to be the negative x star we said earlier, divided by c. So this x star c is the one we found by the uh, Hamadan theorem. Then by doing that, then we see here, this c will be divided by, so we divide by c. 
right? And here, this is zero. This is zero. This is because c is gone. This is by divided by c. This is divided by c, and this is just one, right? So what do we have is, from there, what do we have is x star divided by x c, x plus f of x, so x not, f of x not, is less than or equal to c x for any x in um, sorry, plus f of x for any x in, in the space x. Now I just moved this to the left hand side, uh, but then I'll have x naught minus x. That's why I define this to be negative of this. So this becomes x naught star x minus x naught plus f of x naught is less than or equal to f of x. Okay, for any x in this. And this means that this is a sub gradient according to our definition because we found this x naught star such that this inequality holds for any x. And this means that x naught star is actually in the subdifferential. <coughs> Sorry, that's the point. It's uh, actually in the subdifferential. So this one is a subgradient. And this also means that this cannot be an empty set. Okay, that completes the proof. So if function is convex and it's continuous at some point, x naught, then uh, the sub-differential there must be a non-empty set. Okay. Uh, but it doesn't tell us if uh, how many elements in there. But it must be non-empty. But if the function is differentiable there, then uh, there are only one element in the sub-differential. There's only one sub-gradient. But if it's not, then you could have multiple of them. Like we be even even many of them. Like the example here, at the point zero, uh, there are infinitely many sub uh, subgradients because the sub differential is this interval.